background. He is a former CIA officer and a New York Times bestselling author. His book is called uh, Spy Secrets That Can Save Your Life. Pretty interesting, right? And um, in addition to that, he is he uh, started a company called Spy Escape and Evasion to teach people, anybody, um, cool spy tricks. So pretty fun. Um, and he has been on Shark Tank. So you may have seen him there. <coughs> so we thank Jason for coming and spending our time with us today. And um, hope you guys give him your full attention. All right, before I tell you a little bit more about myself, I want to tell you a quick story. So, a long time ago, there was a very, very brilliant man in the United States government, wanted his brilliant mind. So the U.S. government, when they want something, you know, a foreigner, they go to him, they approach him, and they say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, Mr. Smith, we'd like you to come work with the United States government. We'll give you a lot of money. You're never going to have to worry about anything again in your life. Unlike foreign adversaries, we don't go and kidnap people. So we'll go up to the person and we'll say, hey, can you help us? Would you like to help us? We'll pay you a lot. If they turn us down, we don't kidnap them, we don't do anything bad to them, yet we still steal it. So, this guy, this foreigner says, no, I don't want to work for the U.S. government. I want to help you guys, but he had some very valuable information the U.S. government needed. So we knew he was going to be at a conference where he was going to be presenting some of this valuable information. And on his laptop, in his hotel room, was going to be this hard drive with the information that the United States government wanted. We had Intel on the inside. They said, hey, everybody on this floor is going to be at this conference. You'll be able to go to his hotel room very quickly, grab the hard drive, copy it. He'll never be the wiser. We'll get exactly what we need. So that's the operation, pretty cut and dry. So the day comes. We go to his hotel room. We break in. We find the hard drive exactly where it's supposed to be. And as we're exiting, we run into a group of people. My partner pulls out his gun. He goes up to the first guy and he says, did you see anybody leaving this hotel room? The guy says, well, yeah, I did. Boom, guy's dead. Partner goes up to the second guy and says, did you see anybody leaving this hotel room? The guy's real nervous and he starts stuttering and he's like, y y yes, I did. Boom, that guy's killed, dead. Goes up to the third guy, says, did you see anybody leaving this hotel room? And the guy says, no, 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 I didn't, but my wife did. That's a joke, guys. <laughs> and that's the only joke I have. Now, in real life, that was a CIA operation. But nobody got killed. Nobody got harmed. We got exactly what we needed. So, as Jamie said, yeah, you can keep laughing. You can figure it out. As Jamie said, I'm Jason Hansen. My background is CIA. I was born and raised a few miles outside of Washington, D.C. When I was in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, but I did not want a real job. So, being that the D.C. area was my background, I sent out applications anywhere and everywhere. The huge myth is that everybody gets recruited by the CIA, but that's actually not true. 99% of people apply the normal way, 1% get recruited. And those are the 1% geniuses who speak 17 languages, graduated from MIT and Harvard and Yale, and have IQs off the chart. That's not me, as you'll be able to tell. So I applied, like everybody else, applied to all these different agencies, was very fortunate that about the same time the CIA and the Secret Service offered me a job. I figured the agency would probably be a little more exciting, so I went with the agency. I was there from 2003 to 2010. It is a wonderful place to work. They treat you like gold, met a lot of great people, but it's very tough if you want to have a family. About 80% of the guys I knew were divorced, and those who weren't divorced were either cheating on their wives or they hated their wife and kids. I saw my life 30 years down the road. I didn't want that to be me. So in 2010, I left. I wasn't married at the time, but I'm now married. I got four little rug rats uh, drive me crazy. So after I left the agency, another reason I left is I've always had the entrepreneurial bug. I always want to start my own business. So as I'm sitting there working for the government, which obviously sucks the life out of an entrepreneur, not a very entrepreneurial place, not only did I see my life 30 years down the line where it was a pension and I might be miserable and not be married or divorced, I also saw that government pension and that's it. So not me taking any risks to go out on my own and start my own business. So in 2010, I pulled the plug. 
It was uh, 2008 had just happened. It was still the recession, still a lot of people out of job. My mom died of cancer several years ago. So 2010, she'd already passed away, but my dad and I used to get together every single Sunday and he would make dinner. So it was the weird thing about my mom passing is before he was very much like a dad, meaning never told me he loved me, very gruff, you know, made me work myself to death. And all of a sudden mom dies and he's like, invite me over for dinner. I'm like, who is this guy? So he invites me over for dinner one night and I said, hey, just to let you know, I'm gonna quit the CIA and go out on my own. He's like, what, are you out of your mind? And he told me, he says like, that is, he, and he just lost his job, by the way, because it's recession. He was like, I just lost my job. You have a top secret security clearance. You'd be the world's biggest idiot to quit. So I said, okay, well, I'm quitting. He even had his best friend meet with me and try and talk me out of it. He was like, just please, please meet with so-and-so, see if he can talk you out of it. I met with this guy. He couldn't talk me out of it. So I typed out my resignation letter. And the night before, I could barely get any sleep because I'm going from a top secret security clearance with a very stable government job. So, well, unless the government shut down, but I would have been uh, essential personnel, to nothing, meaning I didn't have a business background. You know, I hadn't started businesses, all that kind of stuff. So the night before I can't sleep, I was based out of headquarters in Langley, Virginia, and I walk into my supervisor's office and I say, hey, listen, it's been great, it's been wonderful, I love you guys, but here's my reg resignation, I'm quitting. And he says, no, 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 you can't quit, you can't quit. So he says, come with me. Now, we were down on the low floor. The head honchos were up on the seventh floor of the CIA. So he's like, come with me. We're gonna go talk to so-and-so, a head honcho. Now, this head honcho doesn't know me from Adam. So we walk into his office and he says, hey, this is Jason Hansen. He's trying to put in his papers to quit and he's doing X, Y, Z right now, so we really need him. So this guy says, hey, you know, we need you to stick around. What is it gonna take? Not that the government really can do much, can't give you any money or anything. Um, but I said, you know, I appreciate it. The agency's been great, but I want to go out on my own. You know, I want to get married and have kids one day. So he says to me, what if you work part-time doing X, Y, and Z, which is a project we're working on at the time? He says, you can work part-time, give me 20, 24 hours a week, and this was based out of headquarters. And I thought to myself, I had no idea you could work part-time for the agency. I just didn't even know it existed. So I said, sure, I'll take it. I got to keep my benefits, had health insurance, all that good stuff that becomes very difficult when you're on your own. And so for a year, I worked part time. After that, they came back to me and said, you're ready to come full time and do X, Y, and Z? I said, no, no, I'm really getting out this time. So I finally left after working part time for a year, started my own business. It's called Spy Escape and Evasion. And what we really do is teach you spy secrets that the average person can use. So we have 320 acres out past Weco, out past the dump, and we do shooting classes, evasive driving classes, self-defense classes, escape and evasion classes, and so on. So I'm the kid who never grows up, goes and plays out there, shoot guns, and have a blast, and I love it. Um, we train everybody from CEOs to celebrities to the next door person who just wants to keep their family safer. I remember when I started out, I thought if I could make $100,000 a year, I'd be on cloud nine. I was very fortunate that I hit that 100,000 a year. Then my next year, or next year, I wish it was the next year, then eventually I said, hey, I want to have a seven-figure business. If I can hit $1 million a year, man, that'll be swell. I hit a million dollars a year. Then I said, okay, now I want multi-million. And now we're a multi-million dollar business. I'm going to share you some secrets right now of how I've done that. This is laid back, so you can raise your hand anytime and interrupt me. I don't mind. Please ask questions. I'll be happy to share anything and everything I can with you. So here are some of the secrets. First secret is what I call human selling. H-U-M-I-N-T, human. Human stands for human intelligence. What is human selling? That is selling one-to-one. -one. Making the person you're selling to really feel like you care about it. Now, you guys are gonna think I'm a total weirdo, total bizarre, I'm gonna show you my phone right now. This is a flip phone. Half of you probably never even seen a flip phone. I have never sent a text message in my life. I'm not kidding. Now there's a security reason because I don't wanna be texting and have somebody come up and put a bag over my head, but also because you'll see I like to be very efficient. I don't like to waste time. If somebody needs to get a hold of me, they'll call me. Those who text me, I never get it, which means they don't know me very well. So human selling. Selling to a person who you really care about or at least showing you care about them. That is the way you make money, guys. In this whole mass world where everybody just feels like a number, when you send out an email blast and 
you're not very personalized to it, and you say, dear customer, instead of, hey, John, you lose a lot of money. One of my businesses, because I run three different businesses, two survival businesses and one marketing business, one of my businesses has over 192,000 people on my email list. And I talk to every single one like I'm talking to only them. It makes you more money. So in the spy world, human is the best way to sell. That means boots on the ground, recruiting people face to face. Yes, there are satellites. Yes, there's all this fancy technology. But it will never match when you're on the ground what you need to do. So one of my mentors, one of the biggest studs in the CIA, he recruited more people to spy for the United States than any man alive. And <clears throat> when I first started working with him, one of my favorite stories, back in the day, the United States realizes the Russians, their missiles are hitting targets with like 10 yard accuracy. The United States is getting within 100 yard accuracy. And we want to know, why are the Russians so accurate with their missiles? Why can't the United States figure out how to do this? Pretty big deal back in the day. Well, after talking to some people on the inside in Russia, they figure out it has to do with something called gelatin, dichromated gelatin. I'm not an expert on gelatin. I don't know anything about it, just what he told me. So somehow this gelatin allows you to form a hologram, which when the, the uh, missiles go into the target, the hologram pops up so the missile can see the target, hits it a lot more accurately than what the U.S. has. So in the agency, when there's a problem, you get what is called a requirement. So the requirement was, hey, we need you to steal this gelatin so we can copy it, so we can have accurate missiles just like the Russians. Now, what you don't do is you don't go over to Russia or wherever and say, hey, I'm John Doe, I work for the CIA, uh, how would you like to come and spy with us? If you did that, the next time you had a meeting, you would have a bag over your head and you'd end up in a foreign prison. So I always say to people when I talk to them, spies are the world's best salesmen. A good friend of mine likes to say, the only difference is you guys sell vacuums, we sell treason. Treason is kind of a tough sale and you can't be wrong. Because again, if I go recruit somebody and I say, hey, Bob, and I'll tell you how we do this in a minute, would you like to spy with the CIA? If he freaks out and I don't know he's going to say yes, then I could end up dead. So what you do is first, when you have a requirement, you go through what is called the SADR cycle. It stands for spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting. That's basically the spy cycle. And there's a T for terminate, but it's not terminate like you think. I'll get to that in a minute. That's Hollywood. So anyway, the SADR cycle, spotting, assessing, developing, and recruiting. If you have a requirement of, hey, you need to find this gelatin, well, who has access to the gelatin? So you've got to start spotting people who have access to what you want. Well, it turns out, it just happens to be that a bunch of Japanese professors over in Japan have access to this gelatin because they're working with the Russians. So you've got to spot them and go to this university, find all these Japanese professors. And if you didn't know, guys, prof professors, I'll say universities are filled with spies, especially American universities. They are flooded with them. So that's because, fortunately, here in the U.S., we have all our rights. We're very blessed. But China, Russia, they sent them all over, and a very large portion of them were spies. I don't know if they want me to say that here, but it's true. It's a fact. So a buddy of mine had to go locate some spies in New York. And one New York University quickly found six spies working for China. Anyway, I digress. So anyways, <laughs> spotting is you've got to find your target. We knew it was these Japanese professors. Then you've got to assess. Assessing means which professor actually has the information on these holograms that I want. So what did my mentor do? Well, his cover is an American businessman. He goes over and he just starts mingling. Hey, I'm an American businessman. You know, I work for this big company. We're getting into gelatin. You know, we really want to learn this stuff. And it's just mingling. It's just going to dinner parties. It's building relationships one-on-one, -on -one, showing these professors you really care about them. Well, he goes down to the professors. No, no, no. Well, here's our guy. We find the guy. So he's assessed him. This is the guy. He's told me what I want to hear. He's told me he works with the Russians. He's the guy that can get me this gelatin. So then you have to develop them. What does development mean? That means you're going to make him your best friend in the entire world. That way he's willing to do anything for you. So because you are trying to recruit this guy, you know him better than he knows himself. You have stalked him. Crazy in this world, not crazy in the spy world. 
So stocking means you know everything about him. Where does he shop? What time does he get up? What time does he leave his house? Where does he go to the gym? Where does he do his shopping? Because accidentally, you're going to bump into him at the gym. Hey, you go to this gym? So do I. Great. Hey, you go to the bar? I go to this bar. You become best friends. Then what you do is you use the law of reciprocity. What does that mean? Well, he's a poor government employee. So you pick up every tab and you start taking them out to these $2,000 dinners. Yes, that is true. $2,000 dinners that your tax dollars pay for. So you go to these $2,000 dinners and then he feels more indebted to you because, man, this great American businessman is whining and dining me. And then one day you're walking down the street and you're in a fine suit and say, man, look at that $2,000 Brooks Brothers suit. Isn't that great looking? He's like, oh yeah, I wish I could afford that. Well, guess what? My company gives me a stipend. I'll buy one for myself and I'll buy one for you too. So now what I've done is made you feel indebted, to, so indebted to myself that you're in love with me. I bought you fancy dinners. I bought you suits. We're best friends. I know everything about you. Of course, you hide that very well, so you come off as authentic. And then one day, you'll feel that the moment is right. One day, and it may take months, it may take weeks, it may take years. But one day, you'll feel that it's right, that it's time to recruit this professor and basically say, hey, Mr. Smith, I need this hologram that the Russians have. I need to get it to me. Because you're such a good salesman, you will know by instinct what that day, when that day comes. When this guy is so in love with you that he'll do anything for you. And when that day comes, I'm going to tell you the best way to do the pitch. You don't come up in any awkward manner because these guys are smart. They kind of figure out after a while what's going on. You just need to get out in the public. So you just say to them, hey, John, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not really an American businessman. I'm actually a spy that works for the U.S. government. And guess what? How would you like to be a spy? Wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if both of us could be spies together? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to be a spy. Well, here's how we can do it. I need some gelatin from the Russians, and I know you have access to it. And guess what? If I can get that, I only need it for a little bit. I can give you money. In fact, and you pull out that nice envelope. It's got about $3,000 in it. And you say, guess what? In fact, I can give you $3,000 today. You put it down on the table. You put your fingers on it. You don't slide it over to him. You hold your fingers on it. So he's staring at that. Because $3,000 back then was a lot of money, still a lot of money today. So you give them the whole pitch about how you're both going to be spies, how we get some money from the U.S. government, and all he's got to do is get you some gelatin and report on the Russians. And he's staring at that envelope because he wants that. Because in Japan, everybody has mistresses. Very, very common. So what does he want that money for? He wants it for his mistress. You know this because you've researched your mark, your asset up the wazoo. So he says, yes, yes, I want to be a spy. I want to continue to get free dinners. I want all this money from the U.S. government. Count me in. You slide over that envelope. All the U.S. government makes you do is get a receipt. Okay, John, sign this. Okay, thank you, because they want to track your dollar. The U.S. government does not play games when it comes to missing money. So they want to track the dollars. You've got your receipt. You put it away. He has his money. And now he's going to get you what he needs. So how did my mentor get that gelatin? Well, here's how it went down. Here's a 30-second version. The Russians don't like this out of their possession, but there was a Hungarian scientist who they trusted, so they gave this gelatin to the Hungarian scientist. Well, this Japanese professor happened to know this Hungarian scientist and said, hey, I've got a big event coming up. Could you just lend it to me for two days? Everybody at this event would think it's the neatest thing in the world if they could see this abracadabra hologram. The Hungar Hungarian, excuse me, professor agreed. The Hungarian professor loans this gelatin to the Japanese professor. What happens as soon as it gets in the Japanese professor's care? Well, the US government takes it, put it on the Concorde. Probably don't know what that is, but a very fast jet. The Concorde flies it over to the US in record time, takes it to a military base in Maryland. They scrape off this gelatin, microscope, you can't see it with the naked eye. They put this gelatin back on the Concorde, flies it back over to Japan. That way when the Hungarian scientist needs it two days later, we have the scrape, we have everything. And we're able to get exactly what we needed to know how the, the Russians were making sure they hit their targets. So the whole story there, again, goes back to being personal, guys. I know that's a roundabout way to do it. But I promise you, if you want to do that, you're going to be personal. You're not going to copy and paste emails. You're going to learn everything about your customer. There's a reason I'm so blessed to have a multi-million dollar business. And I'll tell you one of those reasons in a minute. is because I work hard, but every day I'm thinking, how can I talk to you like you're the only person in the world. One day, maybe some of you had, you're gonna to propose to a, a woman. Guys, if you propose to that woman right there, she's gonna be the only person in your world. You're gonna be praying and hoping she said yes, and like a spy recruiting, you're not gonna ask her unless you're 99% sure she's gonna say yes. 
Pretend you're talking to that woman every single day. Every morning, I get up at 4.30 a.m. I know, I know what you're thinking. Now let me tell you, let me back up here. When I was in college, I was a bum. I did not have a class my senior year before noon. Actually, I had a class, it was a 9.30 Tuesday, Thursday, but getting up at 9.30 was way too early, so I had a buddy, and we would switch off going. So I used to go to bed at 4 a.m., I would get up at noon. That was my life. The reason I tell you that is I wasn't the entrepreneur I am today in college. It didn't hit me until much later. I'm a late bloomer. So if you're shuddering at the fact of waking up at 4.30 a.m., again, it wasn't me. I get up at 4.30 a.m. for a reason. I've got four young kids, ages six, this is gonna make me think, ages six, four, three, and one, and one on the way. So it's pretty busy. So I get up at 4.30, every single morning I write an email. I write an email to my list of 196,000 people. Now I do lots of other marketing through the day, but if something happens, if I can't work, I still write that email. To my list, and it varies, I make on average $2,000 a day. Kind of a decent amount of money to write an email to the list. But I write that email like I'm talking to my best friend. I don't talk polite, I try and stir up controversy. I use ant, so I, or ain't, so I say I ain't gonna do that today. I say yeah, why a? People wanna feel like you're talking to them conversationally. When you're writing papers for college, they are very formal, that's the way they're supposed to be. But when you market to your people in real life, when you talk to people, talk to customers, talk to them like you're talking to a best friend. Use slang, be controversial. Why do I see be controversial? Because you will make more money, as long as it's authentic. I don't care what your political beliefs are, it doesn't matter to me, you can be Democrat or Republican. I'm conservative, that's what the survival market is. They love Glenn Beck, they love Rush Limbaugh, they love Fox News. Because that's me, I get to be very authentic. I get to bash other things and my, my list loves it. So there's a reason people love Howard Stern. There's a people, reason people love Rush, uh, Rush Limbaugh. They are controversial, they stick to your guns. I don't care if you like them or hate them, but that is the way to be successful in life. If you try to be everything to everyone, you won't make money. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, so what, what type of, uh, what one of your businesses are you typing an email to your customers every day? And when you say that it's like an authentic email, mm. What are you saying in these emails that, like, that you would need to say something to them every single day? So the reason I say something to them every day because I have a lot of products and every day I sell. Every single email has a link in it. Um, so when I'm emailing every day, it's my main survival business. So I will give you a, an email I recently sent. And again, every, you've got to sell. That's the whole point of being in business. If you're not selling every day, then you shouldn't be in business because it means you're not in love with your product. So of course you're gonna get trolls, people who whine and complain, but those people are never gonna buy from you anyway, so you don't care. Plus, when you get those emails, you use them. So I'll give you two examples of an email. Subject lines are very important. That's what people open. So I'm gonna give you a subject line I used last week. Me plus two hookers and an elevator. <laughs> Kinda of wanna open that and figure out what it's about, right? <coughs> so here's the story, and I'm gonna tell you the story the exact same way I did in the email. One time I was in Las Vegas. I go, and then again, this is literally, I'm typing the email the same way I'm telling you. One time I'm in Las Vegas. My buddies and I go down there for March Madness. A bunch of college buddies, we get together every single year. I check into my hotel room. As I'm leading, leaving, I bump into these two ladies in the night. And one of them says to me, hey, you wanna go back into your hotel room? And I say, no, no thanks. So I walk to the elevator, and these two women happen to get in the elevator. Well, we've got a lot of floors down, so of course curiosity gets the best of me. So I'm like, how much do you guys charge? So one of the girls says to me, and I kid you not, that's how she said it, she says, we charge $500 an hour, you get the two of us and anything goes. And I said, okay. And that was it. They got out of the elevator and went their way, I got out of the, uh, out of the elevator and went my way. Now, the reason I share this with you is, listen, I have no desire to get hookers, never have, never will, but I knew guys who, when they were overseas, did that kind of stuff, to each his own. If you are inclined to do that kind of stuff, be careful because you may have five guys jump out of a closet, put a bag over your head and rob you blind. So if you do that, and of course I did it more elegantly than this, I'm telling you the fast way, you need to know some simple self-defense moves. What moves? Well, I'm gonna show you them right here, click here. I segue into it that way, but every day I'm telling some kind of funny story and then I'm segueing into a product I sell every single day. 
Well, let, me, let me correct myself. Six days a week. The only day I don't work is Sunday. But Monday through Saturday, it's happening. I do it because if I didn't, I'd be losing $2,000 a day. I mean, it's almost knuckleheadish. And that's if I do nothing else my entire day. So I'm going to get back to controversy. Again, I don't care what your politics are, but the show Duck Don Dynasty, it was very popular back in the day. They, uh, every night, they would sit down at their uh, table and they'd say their prayers. It was a Christian family. Well, one of the Duck Dynasty guys said something about gay marriage and, hey, marriage should only be, be, uh, be between a man and a woman. There was a huge uproar and they were temporarily suspended. Well, it was a boneheaded move because who watches Duck Dynasty? Conservatives, Christians, not liberals. So whoever the network was, Discovery or whatever, made a boneheaded move, lost a lot of money, and of course, put it in back on. So you have to know who your audience is, and you'll make a lot more money with your audience if you're being authentic. So Howard Stern, I don't listen to him, not my slice of pie. I don't know much about, about him. But if I were trying to emulate him and be authentic like he was, it would show right through, and nobody would buy from me. But because I'm fortunately in the survival market, I am conservative, it's easy for me to be me. When you stir up controversy, you will get hate mail. Embrace it, it's great. You've gotta have a thick skin if you wanna be successful in life. So the other day, I sent out an email. Oh, and it was about, I said, some chucklehead called me a liar and said you can't fly on an airplane with a tactical pen. That was the opening of the email. Tactical pen is just a regular writing pen with a very hard point, that way you can smash out a window or smash out someone's face if need be. So I said, hey, some chucklehead called me, said a liar, and said I couldn't fly, with a, uh, fly on an airplane with my tactical pen. Here's proof, and I showed him proof of me doing it on an airplane, and then I showed all these testimonials from people who'd flown on an airplane. Well, I got this one angry email, and some guy says to me, Jason, you're the world's biggest a-hole. You're not a man at all, and went on and on and on. That is gold for me. Why? Because the next day, what is the subject line in my email? This guy calls me a-hole, says I'm not a man. And then the email proceeds. Hey, remember yesterday when some guy called me a liar? Well, guess what? I got another email calling me a liar. Look what this guy says below. Shows the email where a guy calls me an a-hole, where the guy says I'm not a man. And I say, well, guess what? You may not think I'm a man, but you can fly with a pen. And then I show this other great story of a customer of mine who flew with six tactical pens. Oh, and oh yeah, guess what? If you're not a jerk and you don't want to send me crazy, hate-filled emails from Crazy Town, you can buy tactical pens here. And even if you do hate me, well, I still want you to be safe, you can buy tactical pens here. Sold a couple thousand dollars worth of tactical pens. When you do that, your loyal readers will come out and you'll be flooded with, oh, Jason, I love you, it's great, that guy's an idiot. So in entrepreneurship, build up that thick skin. The only people who hate you are jealous people who will never buy your product. If you're not getting enough hate mail, enough hate email, you're not, not selling hard enough, you're not trying hard enough. Any questions before I move on? I know I'm spitballing a lot here, but hey, we're entrepreneurs. We have minds that go a million miles a minute. All right, then I'm gonna continue, yes? Has it always been easy for you to like, read the hate mail? Good question. Has it always been easy for me to read the hate mail? And it has, but I'm weird. I've always had a thick skin. Um, maybe because of the agency, they push you real hard and you have to develop a thick skin because in training, somebody's always yelling at you and trying to get, it's almost like the Navy SEALs because we have to go to the farm, we have to go through a lot of training and they're trying to destroy you so you quit. They only want the people who can make it through. So you're used to being called like a loser or hey, you suck or you can't do it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been fortunate to have a thick skin. A lot of people have to develop it which is fine, but you have to do it. When I send email, when I see emails go out from other people and they're like, hey, I hope I'm not bothering you. You can unsubscribe at the bottom if you, it's so weak. People don't like weak salespeople. They want people who believe in themselves and believe in their product, which is really why you have a good product. If I was selling like an egg beater at an infomercial on 3 a.m. that I didn't believe on and, or believe about and that fell apart, I wouldn't be that great of a salesman because I could care less about some egg beater that's gonna fall apart. But I know my survival training company will save your life if you take it because I have the letters, I have the emails of people whose lives did get saved. So you've gotta believe in your product, sell it hard and don't be timid. Any other questions? All right, I'll tell you another important thing that I highly encourage you to do with your business, make you a lot of money. Make your business friction proof. 
to do business with you to make a sale. What does that mean? It means make it easy to order, make it easy to call. So I told you the story about the, my buddy having the Japanese professor, recruiting him, taking out the money, putting it on the table, sliding it over and saying, just sign this receipt. That was it. That's all he had to do to get recruited. He didn't say, hey, the United States government needs you to fill out 10,000 papers. I'm going to need a copy of your driver's license. I'm going to need your firstborn child and a blood sample. Nope. It was, here's the money, sign it. So many businesses lose a ton of money by making it a pain in the butt to do business with them. So how do you friction proof? Well, first, how do I get my customers these days? I give them a free book if they pay shipping and handling. So if you want to go through this process, which you should, because it'll teach you a sales funnel that's made millions, freeescapebook.com. If you go to freeescapebook.com, it's one of my products. It says free book. You get down to the end, it says, hey, this book's free. All you got to do is cover shipping and handling. It's like five bucks. Why do I do that? Because I want to make doing business with me as easy as possible. We live in a very skeptical society. If I come out and say, hey, here's my book, pay 20 bucks or whatever, sure, I'm still going to get people to buy it, but I'm going to get a lot more people to take my book if it's free. Now, I lose money on the front end. Front end meaning that free book. How do I make up the money? Upsells. You guys have seen it. If you've gone buying stuff on the internet, you get my free book. As soon as you enter in your credit card info, there's a pop-up that says, hey, while you're here, why don't you get my self-defense course? Or why don't you get my home defense course? Or why don't you get a tax plan? X, Y, Z. So on that very first, excuse me, order, I may lose money. I make a heck of a lot of money on the back end because I know the lifetime value of my customer. All that means is how much is my customer worth after six months? How much is my customer worth after a year? If you know that, you can spend until the cows come home. I have never had a marketing budget. My marketing budget is, is this specific product. Maybe it's a tactical pen. Maybe it's a free book. Maybe it's a free DVD. The guys who get this tactical pen, how much are they worth down the line? If I know one tactical pen buyer is worth 150 bucks and I want to make 50 bucks profit, I can spend $100 to acquire that customer. And I can do that till the cows come home as long as I'm on, uh, at $100 or less. So that's why I give away free stuff. It's frictionless. Back in the day when people still had CDs and DVDs, there was the Columbia House program. And it was something like get eight CDs for a penny. They're losing money on the front end. They want you to get you into their monthly membership site. Make it easy to do business with you guys. I do a lot of marketing. I sometimes help younger folks. Make it easy to, the business, make it easy to do business with the people you're working with. Like if you send some crazy PDF that it won't open, not easy to work with you. If someone texts me, they obviously don't know me because I'm going to never see that text. So when I go into companies, because I do marketing consulting, it's one of my businesses, I go through their entire sales funnel. A lot of times it's customer service where they're getting nailed. I'll, of course, mystery shop, call up their customer service, and their customer service doesn't know anything about the product, or else their customer service is so boring and unexciting, like, hello, yes, we have that product. I mean, they're going to push you to sleep. That is a friction problem. How do you do it? You hire new customer service people, you make them exciting, you give them bonuses, you give them incentives. That makes the sale frictionless. So whatever you do, how can I make it as easy as possible to do business with my company? Now you can give stuff away for free as long as you know your lifetime customer value and you'll make money on the back end. Otherwise, you'll go broke giving your, stu uh, your stuff away for free. So you gotta know your numbers. I hated math, I was terrible at math, but I know my numbers to a T and I track everything. That's another important thing I want to share with you today. For those who are getting into business, track everything. I never send an ad out that I cannot track, that I don't know how it does. So what does that mean? If I play, place an ad in the NRA magazine, the link in the ad will say, get my free book, go to freeescapebook.com. Freeescapebook.com is a URL that's tied to the NRA magazine. That way I know, hey, I spent 5,000 bucks to place an ad in the NRA magazine then I make $5,000 worth of sale. I'll be happy to break even on the front end. I don't need to make a profit on the front. If I place an ad in a magazine and it gets two orders and I spend 5,000 bucks and clearly that magazine is not where my customers are at. That's why I don't do billboards. Very hard to put an offer on a billboard and track it back. But anything I do, every email, 
because I rent email lists. Everybody has email lists for rent. That's the quickest way to start a business, guys, is go find who's got an email list. You can buy them. Um, my email list is 196,000. I rent it. People pay me $4,000 for a single email drop. I go out to other guys in the survival community and say, hey, I want to rent your email list. There's thousands, millions of names out there. So I go rent an email list. I have a unique tracking link so I know, okay, how did Glenn Beck do? Oh man, this one sucked. I didn't get any orders. Don't use this list again. Oh, but the concealed carry gun owners list, that one killed it for me. I got a gazillion orders. Well, I know to use that one over and over again. You shouldn't, I mean, it kills me when I see companies place ads and they have no tracking. They have no offer. Everything should have an offer. Everything should be tracked. Because how do you know where your money's coming from if you can't track it? So whether it's a magazine ad, whether it's an email, whether it's a banner ad. So there are a lot of obviously survival websites. I'll do a banner ad on that survival website. It'll have a unique tracking link. So I know everybody who clicked on that ad came from that website. And yes, this is a website. I want to continue this banner ad month after month. Or no, this website is terrible. I'm never ever going to use this again. So track your stuff. That's how you make sure you don't go broke. Every business I've started, I've never had any funding. They were all bootstrapped. That's how it is for most of us. Yes, you see the unicorns who are Silicon Valley and they get gazillion dollars up front. That is dangerous for most entrepreneurs to look at because it doesn't happen all the time. Those are the lottery winners. Most of us have to bootstrap. Most of, have to, most of us have to work hard. I said that I work up, wake up at 4.30 a.m. That's because I finish at five o'clock every night because of my kids. So from 4.30 a.m. to five o'clock, I'm working my tail off. I'm reading every day, a few pages of a book. I'm marketing every day and I'm creating new products because new products are the lifeblood of my business. So if I can read and learn something, if I can market every day, meaning renting new email lists, placing some new magazine ads, and then if I can work on a product creation every day, a new self-defense course, a new home defense course, some type of new survival gadget or bug out bag, then I know my business is gonna stay on track. So in addition in there, there is working out. Going back to me being a bum and, yes? Good question. Do I come up with the ideas or does somebody else do it? I come up with all my own ideas. That is, I don't know what book says it, but your superpower. I am terrible at a lot of things, but I'm very good at coming up with ideas. So every project I come up with. And the best part is, since I'm my own customer, I know what my guys like. So if I'm you know, at my shooting range one day and I think, hey, wouldn't it be cool if this gun had a gizmo on it? I know there's a very high likelihood that my customers are going to want it too. So yeah, I'm an idea machine. I come up with it and then I have a marketing team where I say, hey, create the website, do this, do that, do that. And I tell them how to create the product that I've just come up with. I was talking about working out. I never worked out in college besides playing basketball, pickup games at our, at our uh, say it was called the Deadman Center, at our, at our athletic center. But as I was leaving the CIA, remember I really didn't know anything about business, I'm studying successful people like crazy. And since then, because of, we work with a lot of high net worth people, I've been blessed to work with a lot of billionaires, hundreds of millions of dollars people, so study some highly successful people. They all got up early, which is hence me getting up at 4.30, because it makes you super productive, but they also exercised. And so I never exercised, but I was like, all right, if all these smart guys who are with, worth a ton of money are doing it, I'm gonna start working out. Well, now I know why you do it, because of the stress of running your own business, it's a great stress reliever, reliever but it also gives you energy for the rest of your day. So I get up at 4.30, I, I do two hours worth of work, my most important work, and then from 6.30 to 7.30, I work out, six days a week, only days not Sunday. Um, I do a lot of body weight exercises, which is actually, ex exactly, I stutter a lot too. By the way, you don't have to be a good speaker to make a lot of money. Just, talk, just be authentic. Um, as I was gonna say, so in the CIA, when we were training in the farm, we did a lot of body weight exercises. Obviously, when you're the CIA, if you're overseas somewhere, you're not gonna have Gold's Gym. You're gonna do a lot of push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, et cetera. So that's what I do six days a week, Monday through Saturday from 6.30 to 7.30. That is a secret of success. Working out, getting up early, and then working your tail off. When I left the agency and I was surrounded by some of these billionaires and I'm asking them, I'm thinking, man, this guy's a billionaire. He probably has the secret. He's gonna tell me the secret of how I can make, you know, get my multi-million dollar business, which was then my goal. 
I know he's going to tell me. So I had lunch with these guys. I talked to them, and I was sorely disappointed. Besides waking up early, working out, reading, all hard work. There's the old saying, all you have to do to be successful is work, worth, work half a day. You can work half a day either the first 12 hours or the last 12 hours. It doesn't matter. And that really is the secret of success. I know that the four-hour work week and like working from the beach on your laptop for 10 minutes a day is super sexy and cool, but it is not reality if you want to grow a large business. Now, if I wanted to only make a small amount a year, then yeah, I could probably work two hours a day. In fact, I know I could, but I like growing. I like creating. That's what excites me. It's never about the money. If you're going in for the money, you're not going to make a lot of money. The money will come. I'm not materialistic. I drive old beat up pickup trucks. I live in a normal house. I don't have anything flashy. If you want that, and a lot of my buddies who are very wealthy have all that, good for you, but the money will come. If you're just doing it for the money, you will not last in the long run. I've only got a few minutes left. Who has any questions that I can answer for you as I went all over the place? Yes, sir. You seem really good at telling stories. How does that play into your Ooh, great question. That was what I'm gonna end with. So let me tell you, if you seriously want some of the best marketing knowledge you can ever get. Learn something called copywriting. Copywriting, one word. Has nothing to do with copyright pens. Has to do with writing a sales letter. When you go to freeescapebook.com, you'll see a sales letter. Copywriting is the most valuable marketing skill you can ever develop. I spent years developing it. When you Google copywriting, check out the name Gary Halbert. Gary, H-A-L-B-E-R-T. He's dead, but he was one of the most brilliant copywriters ever to live. And so I studied Gary Halbert. That'll take you down a rabbit hole of copywriting. But learn how to write, learn how to talk, and be authentic. I get paid $20,000 for a keynote speech. I speak at Rubbermaid and whatever. Yeah, it's a boatload of money. I'm very lucky. As you can see, guys, you've seen me stutter like a thousand times. I'm not a professional speaker. I don't know anything about speaker. But I can go there. Companies pay me because I can tell stories. I can be me. I'm not boring and then I can teach them some of my spy stuff. So if you really learn how to tell stories, if you learn to be authentic and find your true self and not worry about people criticizing you, you'll be successful. I really don't care what people think, and that's because I know I'm selling a good product. As I said earlier, if I was selling a piece of junk that fell apart on an infomercial, well then yes, I deserve criticism. But I know I'm selling something that saves lives, or in my marketing company, I know I'm selling something that makes people a boatload of money, so well, what do I care what the naysayers think? Speak, I saw another, I'm going to tell you one more story in a minute, but I saw another hand go up. Yes, no, maybe so. Yes. What time do you go to bed then? If you what time do I go to bed? Great question. Now remember, when I was in college, I went to bed at 4 a.m. But these days, I go to bed at 9.30. So, uh, yeah, I, like I said, you don't have to do it now. Don't, don't go crazy. Enjoy your college years. <laughs> but also, because my kids are six and under, you know, I'm putting them to bed at like 8 o'clock, 8.30. And then as soon as they do, I get in my bed and read. And I'm out at 9.30. When you wake up at 4.30 every morning, it's not tough to fall asleep at 9.30. You'll be passing out then if you're working your tail off. Other questions? Don't be shy, guys. Yes? Uh, are you uh, willing to like maybe show us a spy thing? A spy thing. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a spy trick, tactic, okay? And remember, this is a story because you gotta learn how to tell, torts, tell stories. I'm gonna give you the CIA secret for getting out of speeding tickets. When I was in college, I had a lead foot, got pulled over a lot, and I had to go to that stupid class where it was me and everybody who had a DUI, I was the only non-DUI person, and you have to watch videos for eight hours or else the, I was in the state of Virginia at the time, state of Virginia is gonna suspend my driver's license. So that's how many tickets I had. Well, when you join the agency, you get a nice set of credentials. And when you're stateside, obviously you can't do this overseas, but when you're stateside, you can flash those credentials. So if you get pulled over for speeding, you just say, eh, here it is, and you get out of a ticket. Well, when I left the agency, obviously I didn't have credentials anymore, and I didn't want to get pulled over. So here is the CIA secret for getting out of speeding tickets. This is my wallet. No real security reason, I just hate real wallets. So anyway, there's something called a RAD sticker, R-A-D sticker. It stands for radiation sticker. When you're in the agency, if you're going to bad places, you get issued a rad sticker. Because if that sticker turns a uh, certain color, you're in trouble. We also had gas masks in our leg, and we had these two giant needles full of stuff that I don't even remember what it was. 
just ended, like, ended with the word "een," like something "een," not neoprene, but you get the gist. So if this rad sticker starts turning a certain color, you know something's going down. You've got to take all these huge needles and start stabbing yourself with it so you don't die. Thankfully, I never had to use it. So anyway, these rad stickers, you want to put somewhere where you can always see them. Otherwise, it doesn't do you much good. So what is something that you always have with you? Well, good old driver's license. We always have that with us, right? So what did I do? What's the CIA secret for getting out of speeding tickets? You take your rad sticker, you put it on the back of your license. Why? Well, when I get pulled over and I hand this to the officer and he's looking at my license, he says, man, what the heck is this? Well, officer, it's funny you should ask. I happened to work for the CIA back in the day. We had da 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 And a lot of times that will get me out of a ticket because they appreciate law enforcement. They appreciate the agency. There's kind of that com camaraderie there. Now you're thinking, okay, Jason, I don't work for the CIA. How is that going to do me any good? Well, you get a rad sticker. You can buy them online. Just Google radiation sticker. You put it on the back of your license. The next time you get pulled over and they ask you, say, hey, I met this guy who's with the CIA. He told me to put this on there in case of radiation detection. I thought it was cool. They will know you're like-minded because most police officers are conservative. Most police officers believe in preparedness. And if he sees you're being prepared, that'll make him like you more. And what do we do with people we like? We treat them better, which means there is a chance you might get out of a ticket. Of course, there's no guarantees. So that's how you get out of a ticket. You're welcome. <laughs> Any, good, good, good. You see, at least you're learning something. All right, I've got to wrap up. Any questions? Guys, I seriously hope you realize how lucky you are. When I was in college and I still had the entrepreneurial bug, I didn't have any of this. I had to learn everything to school the hard knocks from making a lot of mistakes for losing boatloads of money. So you are very, very fortunate to have these professors, to have everybody here. Take advantage of it. I mean, entrepreneurship is the greatest thing in the world. My wife is not an entrepreneur. She's like, this. she's a lawyer. The only lawyer I've ever met that I like, so I married her. <laughs> so my, li my life, my wife is the exact opposite of an entrepreneur. And she's always like, like, why do you do this? You have to get up early. You have to because it's freedom. I can do whatever I want. I don't have to get up at 4.30. I get up at 4.30 because I like to create and grow the business and make money. Like today, I was done at 11 o'clock. I'm not going to work the rest of the day. I can do that every day if I wanted. I won't make as much money. But my favorite part of being an entrepreneur is the freedom that I can do what I want, when I want, that I get to create. It is awesome. I hope all of you go start incredibly successful businesses because there's nothing greater in the world. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you. You guys were good. I appreciate it. You were very, very nice. That was a lot of fun, and we appreciate you taking your time to come talk to us. And we uh, would like to present you with the Cedar Award. Awesome. It's made of cedar wood. It's perfect for an SUU visit. And thanks again for coming. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>